A couple of weeks or a couple of months back, time is a little bit blurry to me uh, right now, I was able to take a couple weeks off. It was amazing, it was refreshing, and the second of those two weeks, we headed out east. We spent a few days in West Virginia visiting some friends, and then we went to Virginia, where my parents live, where I grew up, and we hung out there with them for a while, I got to see my family. Uh, my parents have about two-ish acres of land. It's basically just a big hill with trees all over. It's not useful for much of anything besides plopping houses down on, so that's what they did. But there are two homes there, the home I grew up in and the home my grandmother used to live in, where my brother now lives. He has a son who's 12 or 13 years old and is maybe the most hyperactive child I've ever met in my entire life, and I love him. So whenever I get home, he gets super excited, and he goes, Jason! And then he runs, and he gives me a hug, and it's adorable, and I'll pick him up because he's still small enough for now for me to do that. The issue is his dad's my height, and his mom's about 6'2", so I will not be able to pick him up for long, <laughs> but for now, I still can. I picked him up, and I hugged him, and I said, hey, Jonathan, I'm going to go on a bunch of hikes this week. Do you want to go on one with me? And he said, yeah, of course. He is not a hiker. He's not an outdoorsy kid. But his uncle was asking him to go, so of course he was going to say yes. So we took him on a quick little easy hike. My parents did the first part with us. So they turned around and went back to their car. We drove separate. And then me and Maggie and Jonathan went a little bit further. So when you're hiking, if you're not a hiking kind of person, you figure it's easy to stay on the trail, right? Right? There's grass here, grass here, trees on both sides. There's this one little, you know, dirt or gravel or whatever path. And as long as you stay on the path, you're good, right? And that's mostly the case. The issue is you have animals like deer that like to make their own trails that look a lot like trails that people build. And if you aren't paying attention, you can end up following a trail that's meant for deer and not for people, and that will not end well for you. Especially when you look down at the map and go, well, I think I'm supposed to be here, and for some reason I'm over there. If you have a cell phone signal, you might be able to deal with it, but if you don't, then huh, you can get in trouble. Now, we do have a solution for this. There are these little things that we paint on trees that I grew up calling blazes. They look something like that. They're color-coded, and there'll be one, two, or three on a tree at any time. Do we have any hikers in the room? So if there's one blaze, what does it mean? <laughs> Maggie's going like she's directing aircraft back there. One blaze means keep going straight. It's just a way of saying, hey, you're still on the trail. If there's two, it means the trail's going to turn. There's still only one trail, but watch out for a turn. If there's three, it means there's a fork. There's two trails or three trails or however many that run into the same place, and you need to make sure that you're following the right one. The blazes are normally color-coded. So if you're on a trail with white blazes, you just keep following the white ones, and eventually you'll get where the trail goes. If you're on a trail with white blazes, and you look up and suddenly they're blue, you messed up, and you should turn around. Easy enough, right? Now, like I said, my nephew had never really hiked much before. So as I was taking him through the woods, I said, hey, Jonathan, there are these little blots of paint on the trees every couple hundred feet. I want you to look out for them. I explained to him what they meant, and I said, whenever you see one, I want you to yell out to me, there's a blaze, what color it is, how many it is, and what it means. And he said, okay. So he got out ahead. I let him get now 20 or so feet ahead. And he'd be walking. It's pretty dense wood, so he'd see him before me, and he'd say, I see a blaze. And I said, okay, buddy, how many? Just one. All right, what color is it? It's blue. Okay, what does that mean? And he said, that means we keep going straight. And I told him, as long as you follow the blazes, you'll never get lost. Because getting lost in the wilderness would be a terrifying thing. Without a very specific skill set and a lot of experience, it's hard to find food or water or shelter in the wilderness. And that's not even to mention all the bugs and critters that can get after you while you're out there. You don't want to get lost in the woods. I would never want my nephew to go out, try to enjoy nature, get away for a little bit, and end up being lost. It makes certain passages of Scripture, though, bizarre to me. Because there are several times in the Bible when God is leading a person or several people that he loves dearly, and he takes them right out into the woods, off the trail, into the wilderness. And i got to wonder, why? 
If God was an uncle leading his nephew through the woods, and he led him right off the trail and into the wilderness, we'd think, what is wrong with him? Why is it that God leads his people at times into the wilderness? We could pick a lot of different stories to look at today, to try to examine, to figure out why God leads his people into wilderness places, but we'll just look at two of the most famous. A time when Jesus was led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness, and a time when God led the entire nation of Israel into the wilderness. But before we open up those stories, I want to make a fine point of something. While we probably will never be led off into a physical wooded wilderness area or desert area or plains area by the Spirit of God, if that ever happens to you, that's wild and you should write a book about it. There are other, maybe metaphorical, wildernesses that we will be led into in our lives. See, a wilderness is a place where resources are lacking, where there's not enough of what you need to survive. And likely we will all be in situations like that. Times where we lack for money, or where we lack for time. Times where we lack for the patience needed to keep our marriage alive. Times where perhaps we lack whatever that intangible thing is that we need to be good parents, or good children, or good friends, or good workers. There will be times in our life where we lack for something that we feel like we need, physically or emotionally or otherwise. This sermon today isn't so much about God leading you off into the desert and providing for you. It's more about all the times that we reach desert times in our lives where we are lacking for something that we need. And I think that when we study these wilderness passages, it shows us that God can provide in those places. So why does God lead us into the wilderness? Let's find out. Matthew chapter 4 starts this way. It says, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Now I do want to highlight something really quick. This word wilderness is used to describe any place where people are not. That's really what the word means. Not just the word in English, but the word in Greek as well. It's just any place where people are not. And the reason why people are not there is because it's hard for people to be there. Has anyone ever been to Phoenix? Jared, I know you have. We've talked about it before. Anyone else? It's a really cool city, isn't it? The thing is, it should not exist. Because it is in the middle of a bunch of sand. And you know what grows in sand? Cactuses and lizards. And that's about it. And scorpions. you got to check your shoes for scorpions in the morning because they'll crawl in there. (laughs) Nice. All you guys are like, I'm never going to Phoenix now. Nope, I'm not going to. It's a really cool city, but it shouldn't exist. There's not enough water. There's nowhere really to grow crops. Although roses grow there really well for some reason, which I think is very bizarre. A wilderness place is a place that lacks for resources. A place where cities cannot grow. Now, thanks to the miracles of modern science, we can grow one of the largest and fastest growing cities in the United States in the middle of a desert. But that's not the way that things were in Jesus' day. When we read that word wilderness, read a place where Jesus cannot easily survive. And he's led there by who? Who? The Spirit. Jesus was led by the Spirit into a place where it would be difficult or impossible for him to survive by himself. That's disturbing. Like I said, when I'm leading my nephew through the woods, I'm going to show him how to stay on the trail and make sure that he gets back to the car safely. And instead, God leads his only son into the wilderness. Not only that, but he leads them there to be tempted by the devil. I couldn't imagine knowing that I was leading someone that I love into a situation where the devil would have free and easy access to them. A lot of you guys have kids. Would you ever leave your child with someone that you didn't trust? If there was a daycare that had horrible, a horrible reputation, right, and your child was young, and there was all sorts of lawsuits against them and all sorts of problems, would you leave your child there? Probably not. 
In fact, the only people that you'll leave your kids with are people that you trust. So why would Jesus, the Son of God, be led into the wilderness to spend time with the devil, with evil incarnate? There's something disturbing happening here. Jesus is being led into a dangerous situation, physically and spiritually. And he's being led there by God. It's not dissimilar to what happened to the people of Israel centuries earlier. In Exodus 13, 18, we read this, Therefore God led the people by way of the wilderness to the Red Sea. And the sons of Israel went up in battle formation from the land of Egypt. As you continue reading Exodus, and then you read the reviews of it, people looking back on this time in Deuteronomy and in Numbers, you receive a story, something like this. They're led to the Red Sea by way of the wilderness. And what that means is they didn't take the road. There were trade routes from Egypt throughout the Middle East, but they went through the woods. They ignored the trailblazes, and they went out to the place where no one was able to survive. Now, these desert roads often went from oasis to oasis, so you would have water. They're going somewhere where there would be no resources. And there are thousands, millions of people traveling in this massive caravan. There would be no food and no water for them. And God led them, nonetheless, into that wilderness place. They go to the Red Sea and they get trapped there between Pharaoh's army and this massive body of water. And God splits the sea and they walk through on dry land and then he closes the sea so that Pharaoh cannot follow. Pharaoh tries to anyways and many of his men drown. Then the people of Israel collect what they can from the shore that floats up from the army that had just been destroyed, and they continue traveling. They end up in what would later become Israel, in the land of Palestine. And they reject the opportunity to go in and take the land as God had given it to them, and they are told you will wander in the wilderness for 40 years, and eventually your descendants will come back but none of you will. The exception is made for two men who are faithful, Caleb and Joshua. They're allowed to go into the land, and God keeps them young and strong despite the fact that they become very, very old men before they're allowed to return. Why does God lead his people through the wilderness? It would have taken only a few days if they took the road to walk from Egypt into Israel, even with as many people as were traveling. And they could have gone from oasis to oasis, knowing they would always have water. There would have been places where they could have acquired food. Why does God lead them into the wilderness? Why does he corner them against a massive sea between the strongest army in the world at that time, at least in that region, and a massive body of water so they cannot escape? Why does he corner them there? God could have done this in such an easier way. All he had to do was, you know, teach them how to read the trail signs. But he doesn't. He leads them into the wilderness, into the desert, into the place where people should not be, into a place where it is difficult to survive. If we return to the story of Jesus and Matthew, we'll see another similarity between these two stories. Not only does God lead his people and lead his son into desert places, he also leaves them there for a period of 40-somethings. In Matthew 4.2, we read this, After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. It feels like an understatement. If I go more than like six or seven hours without eating, I'm hungry. What Jesus was, was starving. Now, I do want to pause analyzing this text for just half a moment, because some of us, we might be tempted to read this and to say, wow, how holy that is, especially depending on your church background. Say, wow, it's so holy that Jesus did not eat for 40 days and for 40 nights. And I want to highlight something here for you. Now, I am not a medical professional, but I feel fairly confident in saying this. If you do that, you are going to die. Okay, Jesus, we're talking about a person who healed leprosy and who brought people back from the dead. Whatever happened here, the ability to not eat for 40 days and 40 nights is a miracle. It's an easy miracle to read over, but it is a miracle. This is not something we are expected to do. Okay, I just want to make sure that's clear. This is not safe and not something most people do. This is a Jesus thing. This is not a you thing. Okay, okay. But think about it, he spent 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness, and I'm sure he could have miraculously done away with his hunger, but Matthew is very explicit, he did not. He was hungry after having not eaten for that long. Not only that, but I imagine he was lonely. 
40 days and 40 nights without being around people. I remember during the first stage of lockdowns back in 2020, I got to go and work at the coffee shop at our school, and there was like social distancing and stuff, but I still got to see a few people. And my poor wife got left at our apartment day after day, and she never saw anyone but me. And I think that I'm awesome, but after a while, she got really sick of me, and she wanted to see other people. And I remember coming home one day, and she was just acting weird. I mean, like, she's good weird normally, but this was bad weird. Like, something was wrong. And I just said, Maggie, do you need to get out a little bit? And she goes, yes, and was crying like a single tear down her cheek. Yes, I need to get out of the apartment. I said, okay. So we just lived a couple blocks from campus. We went out, and we walked down the street. We're just, okay, let's just breathe, let's get some exercise. We walked all the way to campus and we literally just wandered campus until we ran into one of the few students and professors that were still on campus. And then we just like cornered them and talked to them for like two hours because Maggie needed social interaction, (laughs) right? And that's after like, what, it was maybe two weeks of lockdown. Can you imagine 40 days? Jesus was hungry and he was lonely. And I imagine he was tired Here's the thing. I used to camp when I was younger, but I always camped with other people. Even then, when you think you hear something outside the tent at night, you're kind of up, and you're wondering, is there something getting into our food? Is there something outside of the tent? Is that a bear? Do I hear a bear? And I don't think that there's bears in Israel. Maybe there is. I'm not sure. But I imagine Jesus out there by himself would have woken up every time. He thought he heard something skittering around. Probably didn't sleep very well. For 40 days, 40 nights, plus the hunger pangs he would have felt. He was hungry, he was lonely, and he was tired. 40 days, 40 nights. It's a long time. But any Jewish reader who would have had the pleasure of sitting down and reading the Gospel of Matthew years and years after the events that it described, they would have seen this. There was someone in the desert for 40 whatevers and immediately thought, that sounds familiar. Because the people of Israel wandered in the desert for 40, not days, but 40 years. In Deuteronomy 2, Moses is looking back on that time and he says this, The Lord your God has blessed you in all the work of your hands. He has watched over your journey through this vast wilderness, these Forty years the Lord your God has been with you, and you have not lacked for anything. The number 40 actually comes up a lot in the Bible. David reigns for 40 years. Solomon reigns for 40 years. Deborah is judge over Israel for 40 years. Moses' life is divided into three chunks of 40 years. 40 years in Egypt, 40 years in Midian, and 40 years leading the people of Israel. Why does the Bible like the number 40 so much? Because 40 is a symbol. And it doesn't mean that those people didn't actually reign for 40 years. God is God, and if he wants to make someone reign for 40 years so that when we're reading their story later on, then we can see the symbolic significance of it. Both It can be literal history and it can be symbol. It can be both. But whenever the number 40 shows up in Scripture, we should immediately think a long time, but the right amount of time. In fact, bad kings never reigned for 40 years in Scripture. Only the good kings do. The good judges. The ones who honor God in their actions. The people of Israel wander in the desert for 40 years because they needed to spend a long time there, and they needed to spend the right amount of time there. Let me give you a little bit more of a modern story. There's a pastor I really look up to. He passed away a couple months back. Not someone I ever had the pleasure of knowing personally, but someone whose work has influenced me a lot. His name is Tim Keller. Is anyone familiar with that name? Maybe a few of you. Tim Keller is an amazing pastor. You have a chance to see some of his sermons, read some of his books. I highly recommend it. He's famous for building a large church in New York City called Redeemer. Redeemer Presbyterian, I believe. And, uh, Well, he's famous for that work. Something that even people who really appreciate his work normally don't realize is that that was the second church that he worked at. In his entire career, he only worked at two. And the first one that he worked at was in the great state of Virginia. Yeah, that's right. He's ours. (laughs) 
he got out of seminary and he took a position at a rural church in Virginia, in like central Virginia, not where I grew up. Central Virginia is pretty much known for three things. It's known for Richmond, which is like the hipster capital of Virginia that is really famous now amongst people because of a song on YouTube. Yeah, well, we're not going to go there right now. The other things that it's famous for is apples and tobacco. I'm not kidding. They're farming communities. They don't farm corn and soybeans like we do. They farm apples and they farm tobacco. That's historically what they're known for. And he took a position at a small church in one of these old farming communities. Here's the thing. People don't smoke as much tobacco as they used to. And so a lot of these communities are on hard times. He was in a shrinking community with a low median income in a small little church. And he was a city boy. He wasn't a country boy, so he never quite fit in. And reflecting back on that time, I had uh, the opportunity to read a post that he talked about, or a little essay, where he talked about his time in his first church. And he admitted all the difficulties of leading in a church that never had enough people, that never had enough money, where he never quite fit in. But then he started talking about his time in New York. And how he would never have learned how to be the kind of pastor that he needed to be if he hadn't spent time in that little difficult ministry in central Virginia. It shaped him. It formed him. If we were deciding to write that essay, to rewrite a biography of Tim Keller, and we were going to write it in a biblical style, the way we would say it is he spent 40 years in central Virginia. It's been a long time there. It was hard. It felt like forever. But it was the right amount of time. That makes sense? A lot of us have those 40-year periods in our lives. It's a long time. It feels like it. But it's the right amount of time. I've told this story before. When I was coming out of college, I had a lot of different opportunities that I was looking at. And I remember praying to God over and over again, Lord, make it obvious what opportunity I should take. God, close every door but the one you want me to go through because I am stubborn and I am stupid and I will make the wrong decision. I'm not kidding. I prayed that exact prayer. I am stubborn and I am stupid and I will make the wrong decision. So close every other door. And then COVID happened. And I'm not saying that I prayed a plague into existence. I'm just saying the timing is suspicious and y'all should be careful, okay? All the churches I was talking to stopped answering me. Wouldn't answer my texts, wouldn't answer my calls, wouldn't answer my emails. I had one church that called me back and they said, hey, you are our number one candidate. It was for an associate position. The lead pastor called me and said, hey, you are our top candidate, but we don't know if we're going to have the money. We don't think we're going to hire this position at all anymore. We recommend that you look elsewhere. Good luck. I appreciated that they actually called me. No one else even said anything to me. So I think it was two, maybe three weeks. I kept putting out resumes to anyone that I could. I told friends and professors to put my resume out anywhere that they could. And then I got a call from a California number, which I realized later was Russ's work phone. Uh, But yeah, when I first talked to him, I thought that you guys lived in California. I was like, this is going to be a lot of fun. (laughs) I caught up eventually. But I remember this call, I got this call, and I was nervous, first of all, because I figured it was probably a job call because, you know, I didn't recognize the number, and I don't know anyone in California, or before then in Illinois for that matter, but the other reason is because Russ has horrifically bad timing, and I would have loved to be sitting in my office reading the Bible, you know. Instead, I was on the porcelain throne, and I had to answer the call and pretend, because I, I should have just not answered and called him back, but I was nervous, and I was like, I have to answer. So I had to answer the call and then pretend I wasn't in the bathroom while I was having a conversation with this man trying to convince him to hire me. It was not a good conversation. I did not feel good about myself afterwards, but apparently it was good enough because I'm here today. Russ didn't hear that story until about a year ago, because <laughs> I was scared to tell him. But those two weeks, man, I tell you, it felt like 40 years. Because I'm the kind of person that always wants my next step outlined. I always want to know where I'm going next. Hey, I'm graduating school. Where's my first job going to be? Hey, my lease is coming up. Where am I living next year? And some of you guys, you're like, no, I fly by the seat of my pants. But a lot of you guys, I think, are probably like me. You always want to know what's next. And for two or three or however many weeks, I didn't know it was next. It felt like forever. But it taught me something. It taught me to trust God at least a little better than I did before. 
If I was writing a story about that time, I could rightfully say that was 40 years of waiting. It was a long time, but it was the right amount of time to get the lesson through my thick skull that God wanted me to learn. The stories of the people of Israel and the story of Jesus in the wilderness doesn't end there. In fact, the one of uh, Israel in the wilderness is books and books that we won't go through today, but I want to highlight one more detail, one more similarity between these two stories. The story of Jesus in Matthew, verses 3 and 4, says this, the tempter, that's just another title for Satan, the tempter came to him and said, if you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. And Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Now remember, Jesus has not eaten in 40 days. And Matthew makes sure to tell us, despite the miracle that he is still alive, there is no miracle of not being hungry going on. He is very, very hungry, and he is tired, and he is lonely. And Satan comes to him to tempt him while he is at his lowest, while he is at his weakest. And Jesus' response is scripture. He quotes the Torah, the, the books of the law. It is written, man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Now, there's nothing wrong with Jesus miraculously creating food. In fact, he does it at least twice that we know about, the feeding of the 5,000 and the feeding of the 4,000. But in this case, Jesus apparently knew whether the Holy Spirit told him, whether he just had that sense, whether the Father came down out of heaven and told him, we don't know. But he knew that God wanted him to fast. And so he did for 40 days and 40 nights, and it was not yet time for him to break that fast. He would have been disobeying the Father if he had. And so when, God, when Satan comes to him and says, you're God, you're the Son of God, you could turn these stones into bread, you could eat your fill, you could provide for yourself rather than trusting that God will provide for you, Jesus simply says, yeah, I'm not going to do that, man. He quotes scripture at him. He says, I'm not going to disobey. Jesus is tempted while he is at his lowest. While he is in a place where there are not the resources for him to survive, after he's not eaten for 40 days and for 40 nights, he is tempted while he is at his weakest, and he simply says, no. And if you know the story of the people in Exodus, then you realize that they did about the exact opposite, time and time and time again. We'll look at just one example. In Exodus 16, the people are tempted, and they don't even have the excuse that Satan himself took the time to come to them. In fact, they just tempt themselves. In verse 2 and 3, it says this, In the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. These are the representatives of God, the prophet and the priest. Against Moses and Aaron, Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt! There we sat around pots of meat and we ate all the food that we wanted, but you have brought us into this desert to starve the entire assembly to death. It reminds me a little bit when I was like 12, I was like going through growth spurts. I don't look like I ever went through a growth spurt, but I promise I did. My mom's like this tall, so I did good. But I remember, like, if dinner was a little late, I got whiny, man. I did. I was that kid. I was like, I'm starving. I'm dying. That's what they're doing. They're saying, Moses, we're starving. But then they get really dramatic. It would be better if we had died than for you to take us out here. Just comparing these two events. Jesus looks Satan in the face and says, I'm not going to do what you're telling me to do. Despite how hungry, how tired, how lonely, how worn out he is. Despite the fact that he had the power to change his circumstances instantly, he said no because that's not what the Father wanted from him. But the people of Israel sitting in the desert Satan's not there tempting them. They just start talking. They're hanging out around the campfire one night, and they go, you know, Eddie, I don't like this Moses guy. I think Aaron's an idiot. They shouldn't be leading us. It would have been better if we had stayed in Egypt. Here's the thing. What were they in Egypt? Slaves. They're saying it would have been better to remain slaves and die in Egypt than to trust God to lead us into this place. And so often you and I are the same way. Where God leads us into desert places where we don't have the money or the time or the energy or the patience or the whatever that we need. We feel worn thin in some way. And we say, God, if you were really just, maybe we don't say it quite like that, and we think it. 
if you were really just, if you really cared, if you really loved me, or we say, what did I do to deserve this? We act exactly like the people of Israel. I think there's a challenge here. In fact, one that's highlighted by Moses in a verse we already looked at in Deuteronomy 2. The Lord your God has blessed has blessed you in all the work of your hand. He has watched over your journey through this vast wilderness these 40 years. The Lord your God has been with you and you have not lacked for anything. It's not that things were never lean. It's not that they never looked at their baskets of manna and thought, I'm not sure if we have enough to get to tomorrow. Or to put that in our context, it's not that they never listed out all the bills that are coming out on the first of the month, looked at their checking account, and went, these numbers do not add up. But somehow they made it through. Somehow God always provide. And the fact of the matter is, each and every one of us here is, well, here. We're still alive. We're still breathing. We're still clothed. We're still here. Which means God has provided for you. Through all the times where you thought you weren't going to be able to make that payment, God provided for you. And maybe it wasn't always the way you wanted him to. Maybe it was a lot harder than you wish it had been, but he provided. Every job or school that you applied to that turned you down, or they said yes, but then you realized there was no way that you could actually make it work and you had to turn them down even though you really wanted to go there. God still provided because you're still here. Every time you were convinced that your spouse or your child was going to give you a heart attack. They might have, but you made it through because God still provided for you and for them. God will lead you into desert places. But as Deuteronomy 2.7 reminds the people of Israel, I want to remind you today, every time that God has taken you somewhere where you felt like you were not going to make it through, he found a way to provide. I know that because we are still here today. And if he has been faithful in the past, he will be faithful in the future. So why is it that God leads us into wildernesses, into desert places, into times in our lives where we don't have the money, the patience, the whatever we need to keep going? Because in the wilderness, we learn to trust God. We learn that he'll provide for us even when it seems like there's no way. We learn that we shouldn't rely on our own strength, but we should rely on his. As Jesus says, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word from the mouth of God. So what are you going to do the next time that money's tight? Will you still trust God? Will you still choose to make your tithes and your offerings, to be generous to your neighbor, to do something to benefit those who are even less fortunate than you? What will you do the next time that your time is limited? It seems that your calendar is too full and there's not enough of you to go around. Will you still follow God in a desert place? Trust him by giving your time to others who need you. Whether that's simply spending time with your spouse when they desperately need your attention and love or helping a friend move because they need another strong back and they can't do it by themselves. When you are tired and worn thin, will you refuse to make excuses for yourself? Well, I'm just grumpy because. Will you choose to follow God in an emotional desert place by being gracious and loving despite the fact that you feel like you have no patience left? Will you still prioritize other people and treat them right in the name of God? That's the challenge that we take from these stories of God's people in the desert place. When there's not enough of whatever, God can provide. And it's your job to keep honoring him, to keep trusting him, to know that he will pull you out of that place when the time is right. In the wilderness, we learn to trust God. So whatever wildernesses you may face in your life, trust God through them. He will provide. It may not be pleasant, it may not be easy, but he will provide. Lord, help us to trust you when things are difficult, when it feels like there's not enough of whatever, when job opportunities dry up, when school's hard, when money's tight, 
when our time is limited, when our patience is worn thin, when we feel like we don't have the friends or family to support us that we need. Whatever it is that we're lacking, Lord, help us to trust you, to know that you are the water of life, that you can provide for us, that you can get us through. Help us to be more like Jesus and less like the people of Israel, to honor you, to cling to your word, and to follow you no matter how difficult it may be. In Jesus' name, amen.